Cool. All right. Well, uh, hi, everybody. I'm see. I got to get used to speaking in a mic again. Um, all right. Good to see you guys. Uh, welcome to uh, Avalanche Creates. Uh, today, I'll be talking about uh, scaling uh, your blockchain and your project with subnets. Um, now, this is, uh, you know, obviously for your, your guys' benefit, so feel free to stop me at any point if you have any questions, anything you want me to go into. Um, the way I usually approach these things is I just have, you know, tons of slide decks, and then <laughs> I just jump around and see kind of what, I, what, what seems like a good thing to talk about at the time. Uh, so today, um, this slide deck has information kind of first on Avalanche, the consensus for people that are interested in trying to understand a little bit more about what makes Avalanche different. Um, and then I'll go into more about how the network is structured. So like Avalanche itself, you know, you talk about the primary network, you talk about subnets. So like what does all that mean to begin with? Um, what are subnets, obviously, and then what you can build with them, uh, which is probably the part that you're more interested in. And then obviously, you know, you guys made your way here, so I'll also uh, give a overview of the roadmap of things to come over the next uh, three to six months to, uh, with subnets. So yeah, so we'll go from there. So yeah, start off, I'm Patrick, I'm the head of engineering at Avalabs, so anything related to building uh, anything at Avalabs, I, I guess I'm, I get to take credit and responsibility for. <laughs> so if you have any issues, it's probably my fault. If you like what we do, it's probably also my, no. Um, I stand in front of a huge team uh, that does amazing work. I just get to uh, tell the world about all the awesome work they do. Um, we would not uh, be here without them, so there's a number of folks um, that uh, just want to give a shout out to, as I do at the start of every presentation, just because uh, you know the work that they do is super critical to everything that happens. Um, so as I started, um, you know, I'll, I'll kind of run through different parts of it based on, I think, kind of how people are taking it. But uh, so first off, uh, there's two sides. So Avalanche um, you know, applies to two things. One, the consensus algorithm that powers Avalanche, the network, and then Avalanche network, which is you know, the L1 that you probably interact with on a regular basis. Um, so this is a slide that I've shamelessly borrowed from Goon, uh, who's given this presentation as well like 10 times. I'm not going to dwell on it too much. Um, but the idea is, you know, in the 70s, there's a lot of research, started to be research into voting-based classical protocols. So this is like the Leslie Lamport, uh, Barbara Liskov sort of approach to things. Um, that was the state of the art for many years. You know, you got a lot of really popular databases out of that, Paxos for one. Um, uh, no one ever thought you could really deploy it in an open internet setting, uh, so there wasn't many attempts at that. Uh, that all changed in 2009 with... Uh, Bitcoin and the launch of uh, basically the first new, pr another approach to consensus, which people call Nakamoto or longest chain. That totally changed people's ideas of what you could uh, deploy in an open permissionless setting. Um, and so then, you know, 2015, 2019 to 2015, 2009 to 2015, people started to deploy uh, many of these voting-based classical systems, uh, but they had limitations with how many people could actually participate, um, the speed at which they could finalize information. Uh, there's a lot of research going into those now, um, but uh, in 2018, Team Rocket uh, dropped an idea which is very different, which was a subsampling-based protocol uh, called Avalanche, and it's uh, basically a class of algorithms that we call the Snow family. Um, so Avalanche consensus is based off of that. And so first I'll give you a little bit of an intuition of what that means and you know, why you should care. Um, massive participation, so tons of people can participate in consensus without increasing the uh, latency. So um, on Avalanche, finality happens like under a second, but there are over a thousand nodes participating. Um, I don't think there's anything quite, uh, quite as fast and that you know, keeps it uh, still decentralized. Um, so. <clears throat> the idea here uh, with Avalanche is to do repeated network subsampling. So, you know, normally in a quorum based protocol, you have to know all the participants, they all tell each other what their votes are, and then you can somehow derive some decision from that in very simple terms. <laughs> in Avalanche, um, the goal is very different. Um, well, I guess the goal is the same, but the process is very different. So uh, let me lay out an example for you to kind of give you some of the intuition of what's going on here, and then I'll walk through an example and show you a cool video demo you can kind of play with on your own as well. Um, so the idea with Avalanche is this notion of repeated subsampling. So let's just say that I'm in this world, all these nodes are blue and orange. Um, all I care about is that we either all agree on orange or we all agree on blue, or at least all the honest nodes. I don't really care uh, what color. That's not really the goal here. The goal is that we all just agree on the same thing. So 
I, the red node, um, let's say I start off as orange because I heard about orange first. I ask 20 people, random 20 people, which we call K, hey, what do you think? Like, what's your current preference? Um, if I get back uh, alpha, which we call, or what we call alpha, so like 15, let's say of the 20, the same color, I'll call that a successful poll. So very simply, let's say I'm in this room, I ask 20 of you, 15 of you guys say the same thing, success, right? <laughs> Um, now, if I get a bunch of those successes consecutively, I can finalize. Now, you'd be like, wow, that works? Yeah, so the idea with Avalanche or the kind of the breakthrough is that works. So in a world where there's maybe 1,300 validators like there is today, uh, I, am, I only may have to do 225 round trip communications to actually finalize. And you'll notice that that's not a function of how many validators. So I could have 10,000 validators and I'd still only have to do 225 round trips. Um, so that's a really cool property as a network grows, especially a blockchain that you want to be decentralized as possible. But the intuition is I can come to a conclusion on the state of the network without actually having to talk to everybody. So the, I'm going to skip this part because I think this is a little bit too detailed. But if you want to go to um, the Avalanche white paper, you can kind of look and how this is, comes together. But there are three sub protocols that make up Avalanche that layer on the complexity of, okay, first, you know, we just ask a poll, great. Like, and after M seconds, we just say, you know, whatever our preference is, we're finalizing, right? That's crash fault tolerant, it's not Byzantine fault tolerant. Then you go into Snowflake, which adds, you know, layers of complexity and also safety for the permissionless setting. Um, but the real idea is, you know, like, cool, like I love the idea, but like I wanna see it in action, because that's really how it gets exciting. Um, so, you know, in the example I showed you, imagine you were split 50-50 um, through random perturbation of the network. Uh, the network will actually avalanche to one side. Um, and so you'll see, uh, when I show you this demo in a second, um, through the repeated subsampling of the network, it eventually tilts and then rapidly finalizes in one direction. So um, let me see if a live demo works here with the internet. Yes. Um, all right. So this is a demonstration that Ted Yin, one of our uh, co-founders, created a, a long time ago. Uh, one of my favorite demos to show. Um, so in this setting, you can you uh, you can visit this online if you want. If you just search like Snow BFT demo on your computer, you'll find this. Um, but the idea is you can tweak these parameters and see how it changes. So in this demo, I have 400 little squares. And then I say, all right, I'm going to repeatedly ask 10 of them. Every square will repeatedly ask 10 of them. And then if eight out of the 10 have the same color, I'm going to finalize. So the first time I run it, I think the simulation by default is a little fast, but you'll see it um, rapidly change to one side. So let me stop it here. Um, and so the graph on the bottom shows the, basically the accrued confidence of each of the nodes over time. So you can see at the beginning, um, you know, there's a lot of disagreement. It's pretty much split 50-50. But after so many polls in a row, eventually uh, nodes accrue a deep confidence on one side. Now, if I reset this, I think actually the reset may be broken, so you kind of just got to refresh the page. <laughs> um, sometimes it'll go orange, and then other times it'll go blue doesn't matter, based on like the random seed of your computer, like how it's polling in what order, uh, it will eventually accrue a confidence in a different direction. Now there's much complexity into like how you actually change these counters and everything like that, and uh, if you're interested, I you know encourage you to take a look at this, read some of the papers we put out about it. Um, but the original goal of this presentation is just to kind of give you a little bit of an intuition of the network, like the consensus itself onto which the network is built. Two totally different things. You could build any network on top of this, uh, and we chose to build one that I'll now present to you. Before I do that, though, I'll pause uh, and see if there's any questions or you want me to run it again. <laughs> yeah, sure. It's a great question. Um, so the question was, this is a way to reach consensus, but not a way to validate if it's wrong or right. Um, so yeah, so the consensus problem uh, does not um, basically concern itself with the correctness of the object that it's validating. It's just that it's trying to come to some agreement unanimously amongst honest nodes. The part of determining validity is implemented by the virtual machines on top of Avalanche. So the consensus algorithm will ask them, hey, is this blob of bytes valid? 
it is then up to it to say whether it is. If it is, then it will actually vote on it. If not, it will just say, this is garbage. I'm going to forget that I ever saw this. Um, validation happens before consensus. Yeah, so you don't waste a bunch of time or network queries doing this. Yeah, good question. Yep. Uh, I'll take t one more. Yep. Great question. Um, yeah, so other blockchains don't do this at all uh, in terms of subsampling. Instead, there's this notion instead where they uh, basically produce, um, they basically will sign some information attesting that they're voting for it. And then, uh, so the process, I'll just, there's many different ways with slight nuances people do this, so I'll, I'll give you an example of just a traditional like PBFT system. So let's say that we're all producers in this PBFT system, and now uh, you want to produce a block. What you'll do is produce that block, then you'll send it to everybody else in the network, all your peers, all the validators, basically. They'll then sign it with some uh, you know, public key that they've already registered on the chain. Then they'll send you back all their signatures. You'll then put all those signatures in a block header or sufficient, like so 66% or something like that. Um, and then once you have that in the header, then you'll redistribute that block to everybody with all the signatures in it. So you can see there's a, I think, People talk about the complexity of that as like a O n squared problem uh, because of the communication as it rotates. Like every node will talk to every node every round. But with Avalanche instead, whoever produces the block just produces it and then shoots it out. There's no communication back to a single node, so there's no major hot path. And then there's no like bottleneck where everyone has to talk to everybody. So. Great question. Yeah, so uh, the way that this works is it actually pulls by stake weight, not by proximity. So if you were to, let's say, just care about your particular region, you could be concerned maybe with a partition of the network <laughs> if different parts of the network only talk to each other. Uh, so it's very important that you pull by stake weight. And then we, what we do to keep it fast is that there's a timeout um, so that if you don't respond within some period of time, the poll just you know, finishes or excludes your results. Um, that timeout must be kept high enough such that you don't exclude uh, chunks of the network, but low enough that, like, uh, you know, groups of individuals can't slow down the consensus process. The really interesting thing about Avalanche is because there are no slots or, t like, minimum timeout, the network or the, uh, the blockchain will basically move as fast as the network is going. So many times uh, to complete a poll, it takes about 160 milliseconds around the world, all the nodes. And then as soon as it has sufficient for a poll, so let's say it has 15 out of 20, it just drops all the other ones because it doesn't need them. It was already a successful poll. And then you can pipeline them together. So you end up getting really fast. <laughs> other, other protocols have like a network kind of heartbeat where you're doing something every X seconds. And so then if the network is actually moving faster than that because the validators are so performant or something, um, you, are, you end up just waiting and doing no work. Um, so some of the VMs that I'll talk about later take advantage of this, and it's just like constantly streaming blocks to the rest of the network. Um, I don't think in the same way because of that, we can also quiesce. So if there's no activity, the network will just do nothing, which is also a thing that other protocols don't really do. Um, so yeah, we're, we're working on a lot of protocol R&D research. So if you're curious and participating, writing papers, if that's your thing, uh, you know, reach out to me afterwards. But I'll hop now into more of the actual network that uh, developers interact with. All right, let's see if I can get back to this uh, full screen view. There we go. Cool, you guys can see that? All right, so now that we've talked a bit about the consensus, now what can you build with it? So like, as I mentioned, you could take the consensus algorithm or the ideas in the consensus paper and build anything you wanted. We built uh, what I'll present to you now that takes advantage of some of the unique properties of Avalanche consensus. So Avalanche itself, um, is a primary network, so that's where all the validators participate with regional subnetworks, which we call subnets. Um, so the subnets are fully opt-in, they run their own virtual machine, and they perform their own consensus. They're like sovereign networks that are rooted in a base network. Now, if you didn't have the ability to support you know, thousands of validators because of the consensus mechanism, you couldn't do this um, because the, it would bottleneck the entire primary network. 
right? Like if, if I'm bottleneck and says, okay, you know, I can have at most 250 nodes participating in consensus, well, you should throw out the idea of having like this massively open, you know, subnet architecture because it just won't work. You'll get limited on who can participate where or you're going to have to make it really expensive. So because of this property, um, we can end up having this really diverse and colorful, uh, you know, large network that has regional sections that are optimized for different use cases. Um, the reason now, so the important piece though in all of that is that any validator on a subnet must validate this primary network. Now many people that are familiar with Cosmos or some other stuff like that, it's not required that if you launch a zone you have to validate the hub. Um, now in Avalanche we do that because of cross subnet messaging which should come out in the next few months. And so I'll explain that architecture and why that's required and I think you'll you'll think it's worth the trade-off. Um, so from there, um, you, the primary network is what you've usually, you've probably interacted with if you've ever used Avalanche. So uh, most people use the C chain, that's where like the DeFi is, it's uh, EVM compatible chain. Um, if you're staking, you're using the P chain. Um, but uh, I'd say that this is probably the most complicated topic <laughs> in the Avalanche thing when people are getting started, they're like, okay, there's primary network, and then on the primary network, there's three chains, but I can create my own network with its own chains. Yes, uh, so we gotta <laughs> maybe make that easier uh, for people to understand. But the uh, loose notion is you have a root network that everyone's participating in that's super decentralized, thousands of validators, uh, the basis of the chain, and then on top of that, you can build your own networks with your own virtual machines for particular use cases with different performance trade-offs. Maybe you only need you know, 10 validators, but you're trying to push through 100 million gas a second. Some would say you're crazy. Other people would say with a big enough computer, you can do anything. So <laughs> you know, we don't want to prevent you from doing that. And what Avalanche does is provides primitives to let you create what you feel like you want to create and make it easy to do that without really trying to limit you. So um, many people on crypto Twitter joke around that like there's all these words and concepts of like you know you have parachains, you have zones, you have subnets, you have everything, um, and it's I mean it's even tough for me to stay up to date with I think everything that everyone's doing. Um, and so now I'll kind of show you what people have built so far in a sense to give you maybe a better idea of how the network actually is laid out. So this team I actually don't know who they are uh, made this really cool network visualizer. Um, so you can see on Avalanche how things are actually structured with, an, with given validators. Uh, excuse me. So you can still see the majority, the vast majority of validators only participate in the primary network. That's okay. That's, they're getting rewarded in uh, Avalanche, staking rewards for that. There's a very clear set of chains that they have to validate. You know, they're just doing that. Um, but you can see that there are some validators that are actually split out on a number of different subnets now uh, that are validating both of them. So the primary network plus uh, some number of uh, subnets. So if I zoom in there, you'll see some names that you're familiar with if you've, if you've used Avalanche before. Um, Dexalot, Raptag, DFK, Swimmer. Um, the really interesting thing and what makes this so interesting is that nodes that are down here that aren't participating in a subnet don't know anything about what happens on that subnet. Don't have to validate it, don't have to connect blocks, don't have to route any traffic. So I can create my own subnet for like one of Ox, which is you know 20 bucks or something. And if I don't validate it or no one else does, it's like a tree falling in the forest. Like no one cares, right? You didn't hear it. But if you are validating it, you'll then get blocks, you'll get queries, you'll be performing consensus. Um, and so it's really what you make of it. So if you decide, hey, I want to launch a supercomputer on a chain, and you want to require all your validators to have like a thousand cores doing all sorts of crazy stuff, you can do that without actually bottlenecking the primary consensus. Um, so now we'll go into kind of what this has enabled so far on Avalanche. So um, up until uh, early summer, one of the primary users of the C chain was a, a game called uh, Krabata. Um, so Kerbata had this fun NFT game with crabs and stuff like that, um, and people loved it. So the traffic, and this is the gas price on the sea chain, was all over the place. Um, so during the night, you know, people are sleeping, they're just doing normal stuff, gas price would drop, but then during the day you could see some pretty large spikes, especially right before <laughs> they actually migrated to a subnet. Uh, and then when they migrated to a subnet on their own network, uh, the, the fees on the primary network went down dramatically because all the activity migrated to the subnet. 
And so I run a validator on Avalanche, for example, and during this time when the transactions increased 5x on the network, but the fees went down, my node didn't do any work. In fact, it did less work because I wasn't validating the Swimmer network. Um, and so this was really great for users who now could actually use Kerbata's native token to pay fees. Second, it's cheaper because they're running a higher gas target than the C chain, and then validators that are running the C chain are doing less work. So for everyone involved, they're like, yeah, sounds good to me. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. Uh, so the nodes uh, actually are not compensated in transaction fee rewards. All transaction fees on the primary network are burned. So it, it, inflects a, it uh, impacts the tokenomics of the primary network potentially, but it doesn't affect your payout. Your payout is based on your uptime as a validator. Correct. So what we've seen a lot of people do is start off on the C chain because they want you know faster finality. And right now the fees are also still pretty low. And then as soon as you get some sort of uptake, people then switch to a subnet typically. So they you know you, running a subnet you have to run your own nodes. Like there's a little bit more infrastructure. You have to consider like APIs, block explorers, which we help with if you're starting to do that. Um, but it's still a larger commitment than just deploying a contract at the front end, right? Um, so a lot of people will just start that way. Maybe they're just getting into crypto, they're like a Solidity dev, and then, oh shit, your people like your stuff? Well, there's a escape hatch to like kind of scale better. Um, and for a lot of communities that are united by a token or NFTs or something like that, um, it's very compatible, incentive compatible, to have the gas be paid in that community token rather than some other token. So I think there's an interesting middle ground in, when it comes to system design where it's like, is the protocol too greedy or too generous? Like too greedy would be, okay, all your subnets, you have to use native token, you have to tie it into the primary network, it's gonna cost you a bunch of money. Um, and then there's too generous, which is like, you know, damn the primary network, like whatever happens on your own subnet, it's your problem. So I think we strike an interesting middle ground where like general resources and development still come back to Avalanche, the primary network and the protocol, but it's still a really good deal for creators who get to define their own you know, staking token, they get to define their own fee token, they get to define their own virtual machine, basically for free. Yeah. Any other questions actually, well, before I go to the next one? Yeah, so I'll, um, I'll go a little deeper into like what you can make with them, and I think that'll help connect maybe the idea. Um, but for the most part, you can think of it like a, uh, yeah, like an L2, but it doesn't necessarily need to derive its security from another chain. So think of it like the same power in terms of execution framework, but not necessarily the same from a security perspective. Now you could choose to derive your security from the primary network if you wanted to, but that ends up being expensive. <laughs> and so a lot of people would prefer to provide their own security still. Um, so if you're in the market of looking for other security and you're very interested in the EVM, you know, L2s I could see being an interesting option for you. But if you're interested in maybe a more flexible virtual machine environment where you're doing your own thing in whatever language you want um, and you have your own community to provide security and run nodes, it may be a different trade-off that you're interested in. So, yep. It is. In fact, I think the subnet's probably faster because it tends to be a smaller validator set. Um, it's, uh, it's just easier is really the reason why you start on the C chain. Yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of a, our process is to try and have a pathway for people to go from just starting off to having their whole architecture built on this. Um, so let me keep going and then I'll, I'll stop again. Um, so a lot of people that build subnets use the EVM, so the subnet EVM. So we have a you know, fork that uses that and super useful for people that want to deploy contracts or just have like contracts on another EVM that they're trying to make cheaper or use their own token or something like that. But the fun starts when you have your own virtual machine. <laughs> and so 
the Avalanche framework um, is actually divine. It's much lower level than I think people may realize. So Avalanche, the consensus engine, actually mm -hmm. just provides you a series of gRPC um, uh, interfaces to adhere to. Uh, and then Avalanche Go takes care of the rest. So we provide um, an example in the subnet EVM so you can see how to interact with it. And then we're like, well, you know, we've dog food this to ourselves a ton of times because if you can integrate the EVM with <laughs> the low level virtual machine interface, you can probably build some pretty complicated virtual machines. Um, so the way Avalanche Go works is it says, all right, um, I got this like blob of bytes from the network. I'm going to send it to your virtual machine. This is the part that comes back to your question. Um, great, now parse it. Is it a valid, like syntactically valid block? Yes, cool. Now I'll verify it. Once I verify it, I then say, okay, this is a block that's built on a parent that ex exists. I'm now going to verify the transactions. Cool. Now I tell the engine it's verified, it's a valid block. Tell me if I should accept it or reject it. And then the engine will eventually come back to your virtual machine and say, accept, reject. That's the minimal thing you have to implement for your own virtual machine. Now we have uh, a number of demos that you can check out at varying levels of complexity. The subnet EVM is probably the most complex. The easiest one is just the timestamp virtual machine, which just says like it lets you basically just store timestamps. <laughs> That's it. Um, so you can see there's a mix uh, of complexity as far as you want to go. Um, but where you can get kind of crazy is by optimizing the virtual machine, particularly for this engine. Um, so because it's in gRPC, uh, you can write it in any language. Um, we're releasing our Rust SDK in about uh, two weeks, I think. And then there's a Golang SDK out today that you could use to, to play around with this. Um, but you can imagine between these calls, your virtual machine can do anything. So if you want to like start pre-processing state, you want to start parallelizing execution, you want to whatever, you know, world's your world's your oyster, you can do anything. So you don't we don't enforce any requirement on the transaction type, we don't enforce any requirement on what type of network traffic, how much network traffic. Um, it's really up to you. And so we define it, we provide you even a full P2P network interface. So you can send arbitrary messages between nodes on the subnet. Whatever you want to do, we just give you say like Here's the node ID, send bytes. So like the C chain, for example, which is on the primary network, implements state sync entirely on top of this. Um, and so what this makes Avalanche look like is more so like this cool, there's this kind of consensus part in the middle, and then you can define all these VMs all over the place of like what may serve your use case particularly well. You know, if you have a cool idea for a new smart contracting language, there's no easier way <laughs> to launch that virtual machine than taking advantage of the primitives we already provide. You don't have to build your own state management, your own consensus, your own networking. You just build your transaction execution. Um, if you're trying to modify the EVM and do interesting stuff with it, there's no easier way to launch that modification. We give you the tools to build your own network and launch it. Um, and so if you want to try something on your computer, there's a website I created called tryspaces.xyz. It's like an ENS, uh, kind of like about me website thing where you can store uh, you know, arbitrary information, like you can claim your name and then you can like put stuff there. So if you type in Patrick, uh, you'll see mine. Uh, this is all implemented as a custom virtual machine uh, running on Fuji with like 43 validators. <coughs> I uh, made it MetaMask compatible, but it is not an EVM. Uh, so it signs typed data uh, EIP 712 type data, and then the canonical message format is actually just type data. Um, and so you can stay signed in to your Ethereum network um, and then interact with it just by assigning type data to like update whatever status on whatever network you're on. Um, so I keep it up. I made it like a year ago or so as an example of you know, kind of the cool stuff you can build with it. Now, I wouldn't recommend using it directly. There's <laughs> some optimizations I've made to the VM since then, so that are not backwards compatible, and I'm not really interested in hard forking this network. Um, but uh, it's a cool example to look around and play with if you are curious. Um, kind of what sort of the, just a taste of the design space of having your own virtual machine. Um, so I'll pause there um, before I go into the kind of the what's next section of of where we're going with subnets and some of the roadmap there. Um, I'll leave it here for 30 seconds. Cool. 
Um, so what's next? Uh, well, last week we had a, a large network upgrade to activate called Elastic Subnets. Uh, this is the biggest upgrade we've, we've ever really launched on Avalanche. Um, this lets you, for the first time, with a subnet, create your own staking token and then require people to stake with that token um, on your subnet and then be rewarded in that staking token as well. Now, previously, it was all proof of authority, so if you created a subnet, you had to add validators to it yourself, which, again, great to get started. Is it the dream of what everyone hoped for with launching their own chain? No, many people do not want to control an explicit validator list. Um, so Elastic Subnets um, give you the ability to do transition it really your subnet to a full proof of stake protocol. So you can have staking, rewards, everything you, you'd expect. Um, this one's pretty straightforward. All the staking is actually managed by the primary network outside. Uh, so it's super useful uh, for people that are just getting started with their virtual machine. The cool thing, because it's so general, is that your virtual machine actually doesn't even need to have blocks. Uh, you could just have like a P2P virtual machine. All it does is P2P network traffic, and then you could reward people just for being online for your P2P protocol with this mechanism because you don't actually have blocks on your virtual machine, and the rewards are managed outside of your VM. Um, so I think in the next six months or so, we'll see a lot of really cool virtual machines coming out that are taking advantage of some of these unique properties that you're not going to get really elsewhere. Um, the other one is the big one that people have asked a lot about, which is cross-subnet messaging. Um, a lot of people have asked questions about like, oh yeah, you guys haven't like cool subnets and everything, but they don't really talk to each other. And then like crypto Twitter being the way it is, is like there is no cross subnet messaging. They're lying to you, like it doesn't exist. Uh, no, it, it does exist, it's very close. Um, and so the way it works uh, is when you register a validator, there's a new transaction type on the primary network that lets you register a BLS key basically. Um, this BLS key uh, is used and attached to your validator identity so that when you're participating in a subnet, um, the subnet or the virtual machine on that subnet can trigger uh, multi-signature uh, aggregation. Then it can send arbitrary messages anywhere. So let's say to another subnet. Um, the really nice thing is that because the subnets are so tightly connected to the primary network, whenever they're verifying a block, they know all the participants on every other subnet and all the BLS keys. No overhead. So imagine you're verifying a block with the bytes we give you. We also give you um, a, like a map reference to all the validators and what their BLS keys are. And then you can just say like, hey, the signature came from you know, subnet A. It, these people said they signed it. You can trivially say how much stake signed it, where those, where those signatures valid. Um, and then if so, recognize it as a canonical message. Uh, this compares to other cross subnet messaging protocols, which require you to send headers back and forth or like kind of have the different connected networks serve as light clients of each other. Uh, this doesn't require any of that. So it is a, uh, we're very excited for it. I think it's going to be a pretty high throughput mechanism for sending arbitrary data between any subnets. Um, an example of this would be, you know, lock up some data on subnet A on EVM, <coughs> produce a proof of that, and then have subnet B mint you the corresponding amount. Uh, you could do anything though. So you could lock a root here and then send the root that you lock to another one and do something with it. Um, it's just arbitrary bytes. So. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'll come back to this one. Uh, I think the last thing is that the message delivery and format is fully specified by the VM. So if you want to guarantee delivery, you can. If you don't, you know, it's up to you. Uh, the primitives are just by uh, sending authenticated bytes. Um, and then the last one uh, is actually the virtual machine optimization itself. Um, so we've been working on a few virtual machines and databases uh, privately, which lets you achieve much higher throughput than just running an EVM. <coughs> um, none of these are public yet, um, but something that we'll, we'll share soon is more of a high performance or like high throughput toolkit for people to build their own virtual machines. Uh, a lot of the bottleneck ends up being state management at some point, so we've built a few different state management engines from scratch that uh, let you go real fast, I guess, is the way I'd put it. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, we view ourselves as really enabling the developer community as much as we can, so, you know, we'll try to put out reference examples and stuff like that. For, for many people, we look more to compel them to help out and um, see what kind of stuff they can do, and so we're always open to feedback and... <coughs> Over the next um, next few weeks, 
uh, in months, I think you'll see a number of these uh, kind of SDKs and building blocks drop that should help you build your own virtual machines. Um, then lastly, I think is one I already alluded to, which is um, uh, kind of on the blockless subnet side, which is something we haven't really seen people play around with yet, which is just taking advantage of the P2P primitives within the VM library um, to do cool stuff, so like whether it be file caching or whatever. And so if you're interested in playing around with like P2P messaging, I did a while ago, and it was actually really hard to get started because you have to like figure out a way to connect all your P2P nodes and whatever. Um, this just provides you that utility, so it's kind of cool to actually play around with some raw P2P primitives if you're curious about like, oh, what would it be like to build a decentralized messaging thing or caching or file storage or something? Um, and then the last one um, is kind of turning Avalanche Go into a data center uh, versus having a single node. So the way that it's architected, you can actually break apart um, some of the hierarchy of the node into constituent components um, such that each chain could be on its own logical host. And Avalanche Go, the root is more of a network router that sends traffic to each subsequent worker. Um, and so we think over the next, you know, this is more of the six to 12 month horizon, is that um, as people will try to achieve more scale in their subnets with different chains, eventually we'll outgrow the confines of a just a single host, but fortunately, we got you. It was designed for that. So <laughs> you can start to actually break apart the abstraction across multiple clusters. Um, so yeah, if you're interested in building a subnet, uh, Avalanche, the foundation has a program to incentivize and support you. Um, Avalabs also runs API nodes, block explorers, uh, validators, um, faucets, wallets, everything to help out along the way as well. So yeah, that's all I got. I have no idea what time it is, so. All right, I think we're early, cool. Uh, happy to take any questions or uh, chat about anything if you guys want to talk about something. So um, cross subnet messaging, the first uh, attempt at it is really just within Avalanche itself. So this is if you're going between subnets within Avalanche. Um, if you are going from Avalanche to another ecosystem, you're still gonna wanna use some sort of bridge. Um, I think at some point there's some very interesting cryptographic uh, or cryptography research coming out that can make it possible for like a network to own assets in, in aggregate. Um, using something, if you've ever heard of like TECDSA, I recommend taking a look at it. It's like kind of this cool new like threshold ECDSA stuff. Um, but uh, um, bridging is still gonna be a part of the like cross ecosystem story. But from a perspective of like what you can build within a given ecosystem, I think native like cross VM or cross chain messaging capabilities is really important. Uh, we've seen to developers. Um, and so this would let you remove the need to have any bridges within Avalanche, but would still require you to have bridges outside. So no, that's what makes it so effective, uh, is that none of it's on chain actually, uh, besides the uh, inclusion and the destination. Yeah, so the so the I'll give you an example of one flow. Like I said, it's it's pretty generic. Like all that the VM has the ability to do is say like, "Hey, let's generate a signature." Then it will tell its peers we should generate a signature, and they may not generate it if there wasn't some like on-chain activity that like someone paid a fee to generate a signature, maybe or something like that. But so once that happens, they go like kind of peer communicate with each other and say you know send their multi signatures to each other. Someone eventually basically composes a group signature at the end. And then that group signature, you know, you could include it on your virtual machine if you wanted to, if you wanted to like guarantee delivery of it so that you know that it was actually produced, but you don't need to. Uh, they may just expose like an API that says like, give me this signature. And then you as the relayer or you as the user could then just take that and then submit it on a different subnet, which treats it as a message or like some transaction that pays a fee. So the communication is, it's more like this accepts transactions and then you can format the message as a transaction for this virtual machine. Um, so it's less integrated on the virtual machine layer than you may think or like be conceptualizing. All that Avalanche provides is the ability to generate a signature and then authenticate that signature. 
everything in between is up to your virtual machine. So we'll have a you know demonstration or reference with the subnet EVM um, that does it one particular way, but there's you know infinite ways you could try to abstract that based on your use case. So like you may imagine, right? Like if I'm not recording any of this messaging on the virtual machines, I may be able to achieve much higher message throughput between the two. And instead, maybe you're just like you're forming a chain of messages, and then you just periodically confirm the like the root of that chain on a different subnet, and then you can broadcast any of those whenever you want. So like, there's a lot of different ways you could do it. Yeah. Yep. We're very excited to see people build like different SDKs on top of this particular point because there's so many ways to do it. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, good question. So I mean, on this, um, let's say that you were to build out an EVM, could you? Totally, right? Like you could deploy a smart contract and you like put the keys in the smart contract and you know everything like that. Um, if you just had a virtual machine dedicated to that and you just deployed that contract, right, you're gonna have the overhead of like the solidity interpreter, which you know, if you if you know exactly what you're gonna build, like it doesn't necessarily make sense to have a generic VM that's executing everything. Like, will it work? Yes. But like you know, you have this, you have all this overhead of like the contract store. You have the state store. You have the account store. You have, you know, when you send a transaction, the EVM doesn't know exactly what state you're going to touch, so you can't prefetch any of the keys that you're going to use. Like they're trying, there's uh, proposals to make that easier to do, but generally speaking, it's still like generic computation. When you do your own virtual machine, you can build transactions that are custom built just for your use case. So you can imagine that you can optimize the shit out of that <laughs> from a DB lookup, execution, parallel execution is trivial because the transactions fully specify everything you're going to touch. Um, secondly, you can optimize your state storage just for this as well. So you can have all sorts of custom indices and everything like that that are purpose built just for this instead of generic state management on the EVM. Um, and then lastly, uh, it's machine code, right? So like when you compile the virtual machine, it just compiles it directly into assembly and go, like in this case. With Solidity, you're compiling it into bytecode, and then you have the EVM like interpreter process, like uh, you know, Solidity operations, which I can't imagine how much slower that is than just native compilation to machine code. So it's really performance, and then you also have a much smaller trusted computing base. I think Geth, for example, is like 670,000 lines of code. My implementation of this is like 2,000 lines. So in terms of auditing it, knowing what you're doing, testing it, it can be much better defined. Yep. Yeah, you're going to feel, uh, yeah. Uh, one more question about cross-stream messaging. Yep. So it's actually unblocked by the protocol now because you can register BLS keys. Um, so now it's the engineering of just hooking it up to the VM interface. So we're, uh, I never give dates because engineering is crazy. Um, but it's soon, so that my soon is like in the three month time range is what we're looking for. Yep, Gabriel. Yeah, I think with anything that's tends to be in the crypto space because there's canonical state. People really like to audit it, especially when there's funds at play. So we think that there'll be a, you know, hopefully an industry for that as well. Um, it's a little easier though be because you can implement stuff in you know whatever language you're most comfortable with. So in this case, Golang or Rust. Um, so for people that are developing, uh, it can be a little easier maybe sometimes than auditing Solidity where they may not know all the patterns or something like that. You can use a lot of well-tested tools and everything. You gotta be careful though, like if you iterate over a map and go, like that's not deterministic. So if you do that during your virtual machine, you know, you'll have an issue. But so it, it's not perfect, but uh, it can be a lot easier for people that are already familiar with the language. Uh, so the minimum is one. Um, you just need one validator, but we recommend having more than one because it's a uh, it's really a question of like how much stake weight you want to sustain offline without having an issue. So if you have one validator, for example, 
and then you update it. Yeah. Well, you temporarily have no network, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, sorry, didn't mean to cut you off. The, the questions that keep us up at night, right? Like, um, I think uh, the question was like, what, how do you, how should you think about like the validator composition on your subnet? Like what makes sense for your use case? Um, for a lot of projects starting off, they find it useful to manage all of them themselves at the beginning because they can get the metrics, the telemetry, they understand how the thing's performing. And then after they get some confidence, start to share it. Now there are like layers of complexity there, right? Like <coughs> from a regulatory perspective, you probably want it to be more decentralized, so you managing everything would probably not be ideal. Um, at the same time, though, if you have an issue and you manage everything, you can certainly fix it faster, probably, than if you have to core, core uh, communicate with everybody else to get the network back online. Um, so we've seen people just take kind of periodic steps there. But um, at least on the number front, it's really about what you can tolerate in terms of offline time. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. Last time I took a sip of water during your presentation, I like spilled it on myself, so this, that was a big step. Um, <coughs> so yeah, I think uh, it really depends on what you want to tolerate. So like, let's say that you have them all in one AWS region. Well, is that better than having three in separate AWS regions? Well, I, I don't know, right? Like, tons of metrics you can use to evaluate that decision. Yeah, I think ideally with Elastic, you just kind of end up not being a problem because there's 20, 30 of people you don't control at least, right? So. Yeah, so um, with cross subnet messaging, um, yes, you can definitely transfer value. I think that's a, the major goal of it. Uh, the way you do that is up to the messaging format, though. So, you know, <clears throat> if you just put in there, like, messages, what you could do is just, hello, hi, like, <laughs> you know, is it value? No, right? But if you have just the same way, like, different bridges work, where you lock something up on one chain, and then you somehow produce a message that says it's locked, and another virtual machine is willing to accept that as like a safe lock, it will mint you. Now, the second question leads right into that is like, does that come out of the box? No, there's definitely a component of like having a standard messaging protocol or like having virtual machines decide it, right? Like, let's say I have Pat VM, my goal is to take all your money. Um, and I say like, I locked a bajillion USDC and then I send it to the C chain. Do we want the C chain to listen to that message? Probably not, right? And so it'll be up to the recipient to decide like which senders it actually wants to listen to, what subnets. So we'd expect different subnets to have like a kind of a list of the things that they accept with the stake weight that must participate for the message to be considered valid. So I think it will be very ad hoc at first as people try to connect them for the first time. Um, but the goal is really just to give you the tools to decide. The same thing with the messaging format. Like could you multiplex IBC's <laughs> message format over this? Yeah, totally. Could you not? Yeah, <laughs> so it depends what, what you're trying to target. Yeah, I think that'll be the biggest kind of development edge case is the bifurcation of message formats, which like in some cases you may want to send like an ABI encoded thing if it's just EVMs, because then you can just store that state and then process it in a smart contract. But if I have my own custom virtual machine that has no notion of what ABI is, it's going to suck, but you could still support it, you know? Yeah. So do you think that building a, you know, let's say a Bitcoin smart contract uh, uh, platform on top of Avalanche, that's going to be too costly? 
Oh, yeah. I mean, the EVM is, we already did that one time, right? Like, you could totally do it. I think the question you said to be careful about is the, making sure that the execution is deterministic um, and making sure there's no way to mess with it. That's really the complexity a lot of times in building your own smart contract engine is, like, is it fast enough? And then also, can someone submit a contract that has two nodes disagree on the resulting state? But, like, could you, let's say, like, take a really slimmed down version of Golang and just run those as smart contracts? Yeah. Or, like, you could write your own language and run it. Yep. That's the goal. Mm -hmm. Yep. All you have to do is implement the, uh, the shim I talked about, I think, earlier, which is... Uh, yeah, these kind of interfaces. And we already have an SDK, like I said, in Golang. So if you search Avalabs, like timestamp VM, you'll see a really dumb example of using it. And we have a lot of good docs now on how to actually write your virtual machine. So if you go to docs.avax.network, you'll see those as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, <clears throat> at least as a developer myself, I'm more interested in the custom VM framework than I am with the high throughput uh, sort of story just for the EVM. I think that we're going to start to see that now with like the move stuff with Aptos and uh, SUI of like that takes hold. But I could imagine a number of use cases that are unrelated to TPS or, you know, compliance where you can build a virtual machine that you could never build or never want to build on the EVM. Like a uh, really popular one that's coming up is Clobs, right? Like, Sure, could you build a club on EVM? Yeah, but like you want to maintain the book offline, so then you have a separate indexing server. You want to maintain all the, like the um, like the order mass messaging offline. Well, you have now there's another server, right? Well, you could just have a VM that does all that natively. Um, and so from a complexity perspective, it may be preferred. Um, I think the thing is we just haven't seen any really cool custom virtual machines yet that people are like, oh, I didn't know you could do that. Um, those are coming now. So we think there'll be like an app store of VMs that you can kind of take off the shelf. Right now it's just EVMs because that's really what people have asked for. Um, but, you know, there'll be like high performance, let's say just transactions. So let's say you're a payment processor and all you care about is transfers. Well, it turns out like if you have only one transaction type and with three values in it, which is the value, the from, and the to address, you can really like hyper opt like the transaction size, you can get down to like maybe 64 bytes or like 90, 96 bytes. Um, so you can get down to like levels of optimization you just really can't touch on other uh, execution environments. So it kind of fits into like the app chain story for super specific applications, but then custom virtual machines too, like someone was asking about in the back, uh, you obviously can't build a custom VM on top of the EVM in some sense. So if you're trying to launch your own smart contract platform, but you don't want to do your own consensus networking or storage, this is a very interesting approach that's much more low level than maybe some of the other ways you could build a virtual machine. Sure. Yep. What did you say? <laughs> Yeah, I, uh, I, I, I try to stay away from the monetary policy side of it. Um, I, uh, um, I think that it's important that the primary network retains some importance because it's really good for centralizing development resources. Um, like if, <coughs> if it's too scattered, you have too many different people focused on too many different things, but if everyone always has to validate the same thing at some point or there's a single interface, the resources and developers will still flow into that, and it's really important for the sustained growth of the network. Um, in terms of how that affects the things on top of that with like economics and things, I'm going to refrain from that, but I think that generally speaking, um, the primary network will become over time more of a staking network only rather than having a lot of execution on it. 
um, because all the interesting execution, I think, will start to drift into the subnet world, and you'll want to do that rather than whatever you're doing on the primary network. And the network itself has a goal of trying to keep the primary network as small as it can because everyone has to validate it, right? So if you have like hyper high throughput on the primary network and you're trying to do a hyper high throughput subnet, now you have two hyper high throughput subnets you have to worry about, not just one. So I think the goal would be to try and keep it more constrained and make it more high value transactions. Cool. Yep. I think it's, I always use the AWS for blockchains, but I think the WordPress side of it um, is interesting too. I, I think it comes to like how you want to think about how successful the app store will be. Like, will everyone really have their own virtual machine or there, will there be like a list of 10 virtual machines that people just take and use? Um, and I think that's the question I really don't know the answer to. Uh, like, will everyone have their app chain or will there be 10 types of app chains that have different configs you can enable? Like you could imagine a very simple case, where let's say you have a hyper optimized like transfer virtual machine, but there's a module you can enable that does NFTs too on that same virtual machine. Are you gonna use that same basis or are you gonna just do your hyper own thing, you know, just like people do contracts, like very finely tuned, because there's a lot of maintenance with that, there's a lot of performance tuning going on. Um, my guess is we'll end somewhere in the middle where there should be like, you know, hopefully quite a handful of uh, different virtual machines for different use cases but that each one of them will have many different instantiations or across Avalanche. Um, so in that, from that perspective, I think WordPress may be like one of those types of virtual machines that may be instantiated a number of different ways, but you could have something totally different uh, as well. So, so I think the, the risk is going too generic too fast, so we're just trying to kind of proceed slowly and make sure the things that are put out are well-maintained and optimized. I think like as the network grows, like I would imagine that these become more like community governable parameters. Um, right now there's no hard coding inside of the thing. As long as you can stake, you can do it. Um, so I think a single validator can also participate in multiple subnets. So, you know, in the worst case, you just have like larger and larger validators trying to participate in more subnets. Um, but I think it'll become a problem, but I think it's a bridge I wanna cross once we like there's too many subnets, man. Like, I'd love to have that problem, right? Yeah. Yep. So, um, on the crypto meal, okay. how would a subnet benefit banking rate? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, I think the two things I would say is one, um, if you launch a subnet and don't transform it into an elastic subnet, which is like kind of the open one, you can control very specifically who can participate on the subnet. So if you have certain regulatory partners that you wanna only have processed transactions in certain jurisdictions, you can mandate that, which is super useful. You can also mandate um, who can actually send transactions. So you can have like a whitelist that you maintain of like KYC accounts and then you can revoke or add access as needed. Um, so it's more about fitting from one perspective, the regulatory compatibility. Um, the other side of it is um, if you wanna have your own, you know, kind of uh, engine just for processing transactions or like whatever sort of activities your bank wants to do, but you didn't want the overhead of more of the general stuff that comes with other virtual machines, you could have your own just, just transactions or just transactions plus yield and lending and build it just for that. So you could achieve probably at least a factor or multiple factor higher throughput on the same sort of hardware. So there, I think there's two dimensions. One is having a specific virtual machine for use case and the other one being uh, having more control over who participates, which may be useful. Yeah. Like, early on when we're getting started? Or is it something that's like, at any point, we can kind of switch over? Yep. 
So um, we have two clies. I actually let you do it. So I created a sub, this, if you search subnet cli, there's a command called wizard. <laughs> and you just type subnet cli wizard and then point to the binary and then it just, that's it, uh, 30 seconds or something like that. Um, I think there was a, when I first announced it, there was like this speed trial competition people are doing where they're timing how long it took to spin up a subnet. Um, because there's no burden on the rest of the network, it's very minimal. Like the thing is you just have to have a virtual machine that runs it or like a validator running it. Um, and so there's another tool we have called Avalanche Ops, dash ops, um, that will spin up an entire subnet on AWS for you like with cloud formation and everything on a EVM that you can use and just type in how many validators you want and it'll just handle it. Um, so for many people, it's easy that way. From a design perspective, um, I think it, that's super dependent on your application, right? Like if you're trying to mint NFTs and like provenance is important to you, then you probably want to think about it early on, right? Like, because then you have to migrate them maybe or that doesn't really make sense. Um, but if it's more of a thing where you can move things around, like uh, Swimmer migrated all the NFTs actually, um, you could do that at any point. I don't think their original goal was to have a subnet, but as it became possible. So I wouldn't say that it's required. <laughs> it may help you avoid some tech debt <laughs> later it on. Like, it seems like it wasn't like, it was like maybe a, a design center or like an engineering center can like move over and figure out another. Like it wasn't like a six month thing. Like no, and that's just because of the VMs we provide already. Yep. Yeah. If there were no VMs, then I would tell you it's much more complicated. But given that there are already some you can just use, then it becomes pick your VM, deploy your VM, mint yourself the money kind of thing. Yeah. Cool. Well, I think I, I have to stop here, uh, but you've been a great audience. Thank you for the questions, and uh, thanks for being here. Yep.